Okay, good morning, everyone. It gives me a great pleasure to um, give this lecture on what's new in clinical obstetric anesthesia, named in honor of Dr. Samuel Hughes, an eminent obstetric anesthesiologist and a former professor of anesthesiology at UCSF. Before I begin, I'd like to uh, disclose that I have no conflicts of interest. Because this lecture is designed to be practically relevant, I've made a conscious attempt to include most of the literature from our core obstetric anesthesia practice, with a little bit of input from obstetrics and perinatology literature. I use three guiding principles to identify articles of interest. So the first principle is that the good ideas come from anywhere. Though I placed a lot of emphasis on randomized controlled trials, I've also included a lot of novel uh, observational studies which uh, provide unique perspectives. The second uh, principle is that our targets are pretty much well-defined, um, and so I've chosen only clinical targets where we can make a big change. And finally, uh, I'm using a, a, a borrowed concept from the Italian economist Wilfred Pareto called the Pareto Rule or the 80-20 Rule. So to paraphrase him, about 80% of advances in clinical uh, medicine are driven only by about 20% of published research. So in this lecture, I've chosen those 20% of um, literature, uh, which kind of um, projects what's in store for obstetric anesthesia in the future. I've broadly categorized all these articles into four main themes, non-invasive technology in OB anesthesia, anesthetic management of labor and delivery, impact of maternal diseases, and finally, uh, the developmental neurotoxicity of anesthetic agents. So we all know that um, ultrasound is widely used for neuraxial techniques, and in fact, we have a special session chaired by Brendan Carvalho on Sunday. So I'm going to focus on two uh, studies which uh, extend the utility of this tool. So the first um, 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 study I'm going to highlight is the use of ultrasound to monitor disease progress in preeclampsia. The underlying premise of this study is that raised intracranial pressure is associated with optic nerve sheath edema, and therefore estimating the optic nerve sheath diameter would function as a surrogate marker for raised ICP in these patients. So in this observational study from France, the authors recruited about 26 preeclamptic and 25 normal tensive women about four to six weeks prior to delivery. And then they subjected them to ultrasound evaluation of the optic nerve sheath diameter uh, on admission for labor. Using a standardized methodology, the authors measured optic nerve sheath diameter at a point about three millimeters behind the retina with the patient in a 30 degree recline. So what did they find? The groups were appropriately matched considering their disease states, and you can see here that the median optic nerve sheath diameter was significantly higher in the preeclamptic women compared to the normal tensive group. The authors did not stop there. They also tracked the optic nerve sheath diameter in these preeclamptic women for up to seven days postpartum. And you can see here that the median optic nerve sheath diameter decreased after the third postpartum day and reaches near normal diameter by about the seventh day postpartum. In, in contrast, no such change was noticed in healthy term pregnant women, suggesting that the optic nerve sheath diameter is reflective of preeclamptic physiology. Obviously, there appears to be a tremendous clinical utility for this technique, but the big question here is, does the optic nerve sheath edema truly represent raised ICP, or is it just optic nerve sheath edema that's reflective of the generalized increase in permeability seen in preeclamptic patients? So the next study, again using ultrasound, um, is to quantify gastric emptying during labor. Now, this study was published recently in the British Journal of Anesthesia, again by a similar group from France. So it was a prospective cohort study involving about 60 laboring parturians, all of whom received epidural analgesia. And the authors measure the antral cross-sectional area as a surrogate marker for gastric volume. So this study was done in two parts. First, they wanted to validate um, the um, uh, utility of this tool in pregnant women. So what they did was they determined the cutoff value corresponding to an increased gastric content by ultrasound measurement of antral cross-sectional area in, in six pregnant women who are not laboring but at term. And what they did was that they gave, gave them about 250 mils of non-clear liquid and did ultrasound measurements both prior to and immediately after. And they arrived at a value of 320 millimeters square as the cutoff to determine increased gastric volume. And then they started to measure antral cross-sectional area in these parturians presenting in spontaneous labor. 
at two different time points, one was prior to epidural initiation and one at full cervical dilation. And patient control an analgesia was offered to all of these patients, and this is an important point to remember. And parturians were not allowed to take um, any anything orally uh, during the entire course of the study. And as you can see here, that in laboring parturians, the cross-sectional area decreased uh, drastically from about 320 to about um, 200 millimeters squared during labor. And um, interestingly, the gastric antral cross-sectional area was, about, you know, uh, was more than 320 in about 50% of parturians at the time of epidural initiation, and it was down to about 13% at full cervical dilation, suggesting that um, during labor, in the setting of epidural analgesia, gastric motility is perhaps preserved. In fact, um, when they plotted the gastric antral cross-sectional area um, with the duration of labor, you can see here that there's a gradual decline in the gastric antral cross-sectional area over time, suggesting that gastric emptying is probably preserved during labor in the setting of epidural analgesia. Here, the yellow dots represent those with gastric volumes exceeding uh, 320, and the, the pink dots representing those with gastric antral cross-sectional measurements less than 320. But there are a couple of uh, points which I'd like to make. Uh, first is that this is the first study to provide evidence that gastric motility is preserved during labor. And more interestingly, uh, this study showed that the measurement is possible in up to 96% of parturians participating in the study. But there are some questions about the external validity of the study. Uh, one is that these patients all had longer duration of fasting. For example, the median duration of fasting was almost six hours for liquids and more than nine hours for solids. And if you practice um, in an academic setting or in a private practice setting, you know that this is the best case scenario and it's not always the case. And the second is that uh, all patients had lower BMIs. In fact, the median BMI in this study was 27. And also, <laughs> so again, so that kind of tells you that uh, you know, the measurements may not be feasible in all patients. And also the sh duration of labor was very short. The median duration was uh, about three hours. So the drawbacks of the study was that they did not include any pre-labor or pre-epidural analgesia measurements. And this is interesting because if you go back a few slides, you realize that the baseline um, antral cross-sectional area was about 320 to start with. And most studies have shown that after overnight fasting in a pregnant woman who is not in labor, it's usually about 100. So it's possible that labor actually uh, delays uh, gastric motility and epidural analgesia probably preserves it or maybe even enhances it. And now that's a tantalizing possibility. Okay, moving on to the second topic, um, anesthetic management of labor and delivery. Um, I came across this interesting article about AVE changes in labor. We all know that um, based on Dr. Kodali's article published in Anesthesiology, that AVE uh, does change during labor. In fact, almost 30 to 40% of patients' uh, airways would worsen uh, during labor and delivery. And now this study from the Republic of Ireland asked the question if epidural analgesia would alter uh, or influence this AVE change during labor. So this was a prospective observational study um, involving about 190 parturians recruited before the choice of analgesia. They used standardized measures to take fo AV photographies, both at recruitment and about 90 minutes after delivery. And the primary um, outcome measure here was to see if epidural analgesia would change uh, airways um, uh, in these patients. And the secondary outcomes were to determine associations between the total volume of IV fluids, the total dose of oxytocin administered, along with this airway change. So what they found here was that there was no difference between the epidural and the non-epidural groups in, re in, re in relation to the AVE change. In fact, the AVE did increase in about 30 to 35 percent of parturians in both groups. And understandably, patients in the epidural group did get more IV fluids and did get more oxytocin, but unfortunately, these two were not correlated with an increase in AVE change. Moving on to um, uh, the hot topics in um, obstetric analgesia, you know, there's a lot of interest in non-neuraxial uh, techniques for labor, and uh, two such uh, interventions have recently um, caught on. Uh, one is the use of remifentanil for uh, labor analgesia, and the other is the gradual introduction of nitrous oxide into practice in the United States. So I'm going to highlight one article, which is a randomized controlled trial, but not a blinded one, from Norway, uh, which uh, aimed to compare the efficacy of a remifentanil PCA with, uh, uh, with uh, just epidural analgesia in patients um, undergoing labor and delivery. 
So the PCA settings for remifentanil were pretty standard, and uh, they were compared with epidural analgesia uh, with 0.1% repu repu repubicane and 2 mics per mil of fentanyl. But remember that this study was not a PCEA study, so this was a continuous infusion with midwife administered top offs. The uh, primary outcomes of the study were pain scores and the side effect profiles between the two groups. As you can see here, when the reduction in pain scores was plotted against um, time, um, the epidural analgesia group shown here in the black squares and the um, remifentanil PCA group shown in the um, white, uh, black triangles, there was no difference between the two groups. However, when you look at the uh, side effect profile, you'll see that almost 65% of parturians who received the remifentanil PCA had a requirement for oxygen therapy. Moreover, almost all of them had some element of sedation, and the umbilical vein pH was about 7.28, which was statistically significant, though there were no differences in neonatal outcomes or APGAR scores. Moving on to uh, nitrous oxide for labor analgesia, there are not good quality studies in this topic, so I'd like to highlight the systematic review, which was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia, out of which um, uh, there were 58 studies that were included in the review, and only two of them were good quality studies. The problems with the majority of the studies was that it's from the 1970s, and they did not directly compare it with neuraxial techniques. Moreover, they used a wide range of uh, nitrous oxide concentrations from 30 to up to 70 percent. And the outcome specifically looked for in this systematic review was the effectiveness of nitrous oxide, uh, maternal satisfaction scores, and adverse effects. I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, systematic review, but what I can tell you is that the efficacy range for nitrous oxide is between 38 to 49 percent, and it's comparable to psychoprophylaxis and meperidine. And what about the maternal satisfaction scores? Pretty much similar. It's 46 to 57 percent, again, comparable to meperidine. Um, and the adverse effects, there was almost a 13 percent incidence of nausea and vomiting. But more importantly, almost 18 percent, that is one in five, uh, complained of reduced awareness of the birthing experience. Moreover, there were a lot of other side effects, uh, such as desaturation, but this was only a minority. And there were no um, acute fetal adverse effects with nitrous oxide use. So this uh, paper was accompanied by an editorial by Ms. King and Dr. Wong, which highlighted all the drawbacks of these studies. So first, they commented on the poor quality of studies, especially a wide heterogeneity in the studies that were included, with a high risk for bias, inconsistent findings between the studies, uh, and more importantly, highlighted the varied methods of administration. It was continuous versus intermittent, different concentrations, so none of these were standardized. So it was very hard to draw any meaningful conclusions from the study. And also, the, uh, the editorial goes on to um, um, advise caution with adverse effects of nitrous oxide. We all know that it inhibits methionine synthase, which is a critical uh, component of DNA synthesis and catecholamine release. And it also talks about uh, the impact of nitrous oxide on neuroapoptosis in the developing brain. And we're going to have a separate topic uh, tomorrow. And also the hazards of occupational exposure. And this editorial recommended that we need to standardize our lab labor pain measurements and also uh, probably do some non-human primate studies along with uh, studies uh, using consistent nitrous oxide dose and delivery systems. So, so this would give us a much more meaningful um, idea of where nitrous oxide stands in current day obstetric practice. But perhaps the most uh, striking and poignant uh, comment was the last paragraph of the editorial. So children are our natural best resource. Uh, to the best of our ability, we should carefully evaluate any procedures and drugs that might expose them to harm. Nitrous oxide for labor analgesia is one such drug. So moving on to uh, some complications associated with epidural analgesia, one of the most devastating complications is posterior puncture headache. And what we knew, uh, know so far is that there's a wide variability in the management after dural puncture. Now, there are a lot of centers that use a repeat epidural technique and some that do a spinal catheter. There's a lack of consensus in this particular um, topic. And there's emerging evidence to suggest that intrathecal catheters do not reduce the incidence of PDPH or the need for epidural blood patch when used only during labor. So the first study I'm going to highlight is a study from the United Kingdom by Russell et al. So this was a study, it was a prospective control study involving 19 institutions in the United Kingdom. And the, one of the stipulations was that the spinal catheter should remain in situ for 24 to 36 hours postpartum. 
So the primary outcome of the study was the occurrence of PDPH and the need for epidural blood patch, and the secondary outcomes were the complications of these techniques. So of the 97 protocol compliant women, 50 received a, a spinal catheter and 47 had their epidurals recited after an accidental dural puncture. So in this study, conversion to spinal analgesia did not reduce the incidence of postural puncture headache, nor did it decrease the need for an epidural blood patch. However, repeat attempts at epidural placement and uh, an increased incidence of um, accidental dural puncture was noted in the study in the repeat epidural group. However, this raises a red flag. Remember that this study comes from the United Kingdom where there is no attending supervision. So it's possible that um, uh, a junior uh, trainee anesthesiologist kept making the same mistakes. So this may not be applicable to um, a contemporary American practice. There are other problems with the study design. Uh, only 18 of the 55 spinal catheters were actually left in situ for more than 24 hours as recommended. And there was a disproportional representation of patients. Though there were 19 institutions in the study, majority of the data came from only four institutions. And there are a lot of other confounding variables that were not accounted for in the study, including the incidence of cesarean delivery, the use of neuraxial morphine, IBMIs, not, none, none of this was accounted for. And so there was uh, some concern with quality control of the study, but this uh, remains the only prospective uh, study so far. And uh, we'll have more on this topic when uh, Dr. Sen and uh, Dr. Nelson debate about the pros and cons of repeat epidural versus um, intrathecal catheter placement later this afternoon. Moving on to another um, interesting study, again, which gives us a novel um, um, insight into the incidence of chronic headache after an accidental dural puncture. Now, this study comes from Dr. Pam Flood's group, uh, which um, looks, uh, used a case control study design, um, and the authors asked the question if an accidental dural puncture was associated with chronic headache, chronic back pain, and pain disability. So the cases in this study were 40 parturians who had an accidental dural puncture, and the controls were 40 age, age weight, time of delivery matched uh, controls without an accidental dural puncture. And 12 to 24 months after delivery, the investigators administered two well-validated questionnaires to assess the headache and back pain symptoms over the telephone. So approximately 18 months after childbirth, 28% of parturians with a history of dual puncture, shown here in yellow bars, reported a headache compared to only 5% in the control group, mark and gray. Patients who had a dual puncture were more likely to also have chronic back pain, uh, with a those in the dural puncture group reporting almost a 43% incidence, whereas uh, the incidence was only 15% in the control group. Both of these findings were statistically significant, and not surprisingly, both chronic headache and chronic back pain were accompanied by significant disability. The question here is, does an epidural blood patch uh, alter the incidence of chronic headache and back pain in these patients? Though the study was not powered to answer this question, the investigators did um, ask this question and did an analysis. So within the dural puncture group, there was a trend towards lower incidence of chronic headache in patients that received an epidural blood patch shown here in uh, red. The authors also noticed an intriguing trend where epidural blood patches decreased the incidence of low back pain, which was counterintuitive. However, none of these differences were statistically significant because the study was underpowered. Nevertheless, the study does raise the possibility that we might have overlooked a significant long-term complication of neuraxial technique and therefore calls uh, us to investigate this phenomenon prospectively. And moving on to postpartum hemorrhage, uh, when severe obstetric hemorrhage fails to respond to pharmacological treatment, one of the uh, life-saving interventions is, post is peripartum hysterectomy. So this study by uh, Bateman's group looked at um, quantific quantifying the incidence of peripartum hysterectomy in the United States. So using a large database of uh, the nationwide inpatient sample uh, between the years 94 and 2007, uh, Dr. Bateman attempted to quantify the incidence and also uh, identify the maternal characteristics that lead to peripartum hysterectomy. Not surprisingly, there was a gradual increase in the rate of peripartum hysterectomy, and this uptick uh, starts around the year 2000. And uh, this is rate per 100,000 deliveries. And majority of this increase was triggered by two main um, events. One is abnormal placentation, show, shown here in the orange line, and the other is uterine atony, shown here in the yellow line. Overall, there was a 15% increase in the incidence of peripartum hysterectomy in the United States per 100,000 deliveries, and hysterectomy in the setting of abnormal placentation increased by 
over this time period, which is explained by an increasing proportion of uh, delivering women with a prior cesarean delivery. Hysterectomy for uterine atony increased uh, by 130%, though the overall numbers were still low. And in addition, the authors also provide strong evidence that an increased rate of cesarean delivery is responsible for a majority of these cases. For example, even a primary cesarean delivery was associated with a two and a half fold increase in risk, and this risk increases fourfold with a repeat cesarean delivery. And moving on to a more contentious topic, uh, epidural-associated fever. Uh, only recently, we've started to open the black box, uh, trying to understand the mechanisms uh, driving fever in patients receiving epidurals and what we could do to mitigate this phenomenon. So what we know so far is that maternal temperature increases during labor. The etiology is still uh, unclear. We do know that maternal fever is associated with adverse uh, neonatal outcomes, including a higher incidence of neurological depression in neonates. And recent evidence, um, uh, as, which was highlighted by uh, a review article by Scott Siegel, suggested that maternal inflammation could be responsible, but the role of epidural analgesia still remains unclear. So the first study I'm going to highlight, um, which uh, received a lot of publicity, is by Dr. Liebermann's group, which looked at uh, interpartum temperature elevation after epidural analgesia. So this was a retrospective cohort study that included all infants born in the year 2000. And the study asked two questions. Is epidural analgesia associated with adverse neonatal outcomes in the absence of temperature elevation? And the second objective was, um, what is the impact of epidural-related temperature elevation on the neonatal outcomes? And the outcomes they specifically looked for, looked for were hypotonia, low APGAR scores, the need for assisted ventilation, and early onset seizures. So the authors did two separate analyses to answer these questions. To answer the first question, the authors included all patients who did not have a rise in maternal temperature during labor. And to answer the second question, the authors did analysis only in the epidural group, which was divided into the different categories of temperature rise. So what are the outcomes in the absence of temperature elevation? And you can see here that despite a longer labor and a higher rate of Pitocin use in the epidural group, there were no significant differences in adverse neonatal outcomes in the absence of fever. But what about the outcomes in the presence of temperature elevation? And you are able to see here clearly that there's a linear dose-response relationship between fever and adverse neonatal outcomes. So the group that received epidural analgesia and did not uh, get a fever is shown in the gray column. You can see here that the incidence of hypotonia, assisted ventilation, low APGAR scores, and neonatal seizures was highest in the group that developed fever greater than 101 degree Fahrenheit. But interestingly, the same group also had the longest labor and the highest rate of Pitocin use. So the study establishes that elevated maternal temperature is associated with adverse neonatal outcomes, but does not prove a causal association between epidural analgesia and maternal fever. There are some caveats to be borne in mind. So one is um, the study design, because it's a repetitive, retrospective use of the same database over and over again. So this group has published more than three studies using the same database. There's no correction for multiple testing. And there's a lack of chronological relationship between epidural placement and fever. So we are not entirely sure whether the fever you know, what happened at the time of epidural placement or uh, what the time course was. Um, so this is not uh, clear from the study. And the second is that it's not controlled for the usual confounding variables, you know, the number of cervical exams, uh, the use of prostaglandins, et cetera. And finally, the most important uh, limitation was a lack of a group of febrile women without epidural analgesia for comparison. Okay? And just when you think that, okay, we get this, you know, comes another study by Mike Frolic, which uh, bucks the trend and uh, points us in a new direction. So this study was published in Anesthesiology, and this was a prospective cohort study uh, which included parturians admitted for labor induction. And the primary research aim of the study was to um, uh, get the time course of maternal temperature during labor, both individually and as a group. And the secondary research aims were to investigate whether duration of labor, epidural analgesia, oxytocin dose, or length of rupture of membranes to delivery would be associated with an increase in maternal temperature. All the parturians admitted for labor induction were recruited, and oral temperature was measured hourly after admission in a standardized manner. The uniqueness of the study actually comes from the use of complex statistical methods, which I had a difficult time understanding, but I'm just going to quickly highlight uh, that they used a mixed linear model to track temperature change over time, and they did a regression analysis to test the effects of all these covariates. 
And then they used a student's t-test to compare those with positive and negative temperature slopes, as well as to compare before and after epidural analgesia slopes. So this graph here kind of gives you an idea. Uh, it's all the temperature data centered around the time of epidural placement, which is marked by a vertical blue line. And for each hour, the temperature values have been summarized as box plots. The red arrow here represents the linear temperature trend, which clearly shows a gradual rise in temperature. But please note that most of the temperature measurements were still between 36 and 37 degrees Celsius. The authors then separated out patients uh, who had a positive temperature slope and compared them to those who had a negative temperature slope. So patients with a positive temperature slope are depicted in the gray bars and those with a negative temperature slope in the yellow bars. And out of the four factors that were analyzed, only a long duration of rupture of membranes and a higher BMI were significantly correlated with a positive temperature change in labor. And to summarize, there were no overall significant uh, trend, uh, linear ten there was an overall significant linear tr trend of temperature increase over time in patients undergoing labor, but this temperature increase was associated with a higher body mass index and prolonged rupture of membranes before delivery. Epidural analgesia had no effect on maternal temperature in this study. And so this is where we stand um, after these two studies and further research is uh, required. And moving on to um, another um, new topic, which has uh, gained a lot of attention, is the incidence of chronic pain after childbirth. So what's unique about this population? So what we know so far is that um, the incidence of chronic pain is about 4 to 10% after vaginal delivery and about 6 to 18% with cesarean delivery. But the problem with the majority of these studies is that it's not adjusted or controlled for pre-existing pain. And there are a lot of, uh, there's a lack of high quality studies in this field, despite the scale of public health impact. And this was addressed by this wonderful study published in anesthesiology early in 2013, uh, which um, actually looked at the incidence of chronic pain at one year after delivery um, in, um, in a prospective multi-center study involving four centers in the United States and Europe. So over 2,500 patients were interviewed within 36 hours after delivery, and they were followed up by two, six, and 12 months postpartum. And the primary outcome of the study was to understand the incidence and identify risk factors for chronic pain uh, after delivery up to 12 months. So the problem with the study was that uh, the data from uh, Europe was not forthcoming, so most of the analysis was done on data from the centers in the United States. Uh, the authors did um, uh, adjust for um, uh, the missing data by two different models, on the pain dropout model, the other is a mis uh, missing imputation model. And you can see here that the, the number of patients with chronic pain um, plotted uh, along the um, uh, vertical axis against the uh, months after delivery along the horizontal axis, the incidence is about 10% uh, at about two months, but this declines drastically to about 2% at uh, six months, which is actually the definition of chronic pain, and it's now down to less than 1% at one year after delivery. So for some reason, pregnant women seem to behave differently from other surgical populations. Uh, so there is something which is protective. Either the tissue trauma is not uh, good enough to trigger a chronic pain response, or there could be some biological factors that make uh, pregnant women, uh, especially in the postpartum period, um, uh, less susceptible to chronic pain. And to investigate this phenomenon, they also uh, published a, a study using a rat pain model, using mid-trimester spinal nerve ligation. And they used both pregnant and non-pregnant rats for the study, we tested for uh, hypersensitivity to mechanical stimulus during and after pregnancy. And the primary outcome in this study was to detect a change in hypersensitivity over time and also explore the role of oxytocin. And here, the withdrawal thresholds are plotted against uh, the uh, um, uh, days before and after delivery. And you can see here that the red circles, which represent pregnant postpartum women, you can see that after delivery, there's a gradual increase in uh, withdrawal thresholds, suggesting that they become less sensitive to uh, pain, uh, painful stimulus. So the authors asked the question, what a biological factor could be prompting this change, and they uh, settled on oxytocin as a molecule which could have profound analgesic effects. So they quantified CSF oxytocin levels in the uh, DAMS, um, in the sorry, in the postpartum period, and they were able to see that the CSF oxytocin levels were much higher um, in, um, uh, when the pups were uh, uh, housed with the mother. 
And when they were separated, the CSF oxytocin levels were much lower. So this kind of pointed uh, to the um, uh, notion that oxytocin could be playing a role. And what they did was they injected oxytocin intrathecally in these rats, and they were able to show a prolongation of uh, withdrawal thresholds. So this suggests that uh, CSF oxytocin could probably uh, play a role in decreasing the incidence of chronic pain uh, in this population after childbirth. And moving on to the impact of maternal diseases, I'm going to highlight two um, studies, uh, one on preeclampsia and the other on congenital heart disease. We all know that preeclampsia is one of the leading causes of maternal and fetal mortality and morbidity, and it continues um, uh, despite uh, our best um, interventions. Uh, all the consensus guidelines have helped us uh, with management of these patients. Uh, tailored and individualized management has been a challenge because of lack of prognostic biomarkers. What we know so far is that uh, preeclampsia is characterized by altered circulating angiogenic factors, especially uh, the, the factor SFLT1 and placental growth factor. And we do know that the SFLT1 to placental growth factor ratio is able to identify women with early onset preeclampsia. And this year we have about two uh, studies which uh, factor this ratio into the realm of clinical decision making. So this first study was a prospective cohort study that recruited about 616 women who were evaluated for suspected preeclampsia. The authors measured the plasma levels of SFLT1 and placental growth factor at presentation, and then examined for an association between the ratio and adverse maternal and neonatal outcomes at two weeks. The adverse maternal outcomes included in this study were all complications associated with preeclampsia, and adverse fetal outcomes included iatrogenic delivery, small for gestational age, abnormal umbilical artery dopplers, fetal and neonatal death. So what do they find? In this graph, you see adverse outcomes um, plotted against natural log transformed ratios, and the median ratio at presentation was significantly elevated in, par in participants who eventually experienced adverse outcomes marked in red, compared with those who did not marked in blue. Since 34 weeks appears to be uh, the magic number where most of the decisions about delivering patients are made, the authors did a separate analysis in these patients. And here, the black arrow represents um, a ratio of 85, and you can see here that it clearly distinguishes uh, participants who ended up with adverse outcomes compared to those who did not. But what about the specific uh, side effects or complications of preeclampsia? The authors again plotted the ratio against specific complications, such as abruction, altered liver function tests, and abnormal Dopplers. And you can see here that the ratio of 85, again, clearly distinguishes patients who had these complications from those who did not. Furthermore, when they plotted the uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curves, uh, you can see here that those who had a ratio of greater than 85, almost 85% of them delivered within two weeks, compared to only about 15% who had a ratio greater than 85. And a similar study was designed to characterize the ratios in different types of hypertensive uh, disorders of pregnancy. And in this study, this is a box and whisker plot uh, displaying the logarithmic distribution of the ratio in patients with preeclampsia and HELP, gestational hypertension, and chronic hypertension compared to healthy controls. And you can see here that um, the ratio of um, more than 85 clearly separates patients with preeclampsia from other types of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So what these studies collectively suggest is that uh, a ratio greater than 85 is able to predict adverse outcomes occurring within two weeks, and it identifies women at a greater risk for imminent delivery, and also is able to stratify hypertensive disorders with reasonable precision. Moving on to uh, congenital heart disease, we always encounter these patients, and we are at a loss to tell them exactly what their risks are um, in terms of their disease and their labor and delivery outcomes. So this study published in the journal Heart kind of uh, gives us an idea. It was a retrospective cohort study, uh, and the primary aim of the study was to quantify the incidence of adverse cardiovascular outcomes among women with congenital heart disease during childbirth. Uh, the database was the uh, nationwide inpatient sample, and the outcomes they specifically looked for was arrhythmias, heart failure, embolism, and death. Not surprisingly, women with congenital heart disease were more likely to sustain a cardiovascular event. The most common adverse effect was arrhythmia, but there were a couple of um, complications that were specific for patients with congenital heart disease. This was a much, much higher incidence of heart failure and a much higher incidence of a cerebrovascular accident. The odds ratios were 20 and 40, respectively, compared to healthy controls. 
And this graph here plots the odds ratios for adverse outcomes against disease severity. The top half of the graph depicts the odds ratios for women with congenital heart disease overall, and then stratified for women with complex, unclassified, and simple congenital heart disease. And the bottom half of the figure shows uh, for each subcategory of congenital heart disease stratified by the presence and absence of pulmonary hypertension. And women without congenital heart disease serve as reference in the dotted line. You can see here that complex congenital heart disease and the presence of pulmonary hypertension were associated with greater odds of having an adverse cardiovascular event than simple congenital heart disease. And moving on to the last topic, uh, it's developmental neurotoxicity of anesthetic agents. We have a separate lecture on this topic um, tomorrow, but I'm gonna just quickly go through this topic um, in case if someone's gonna miss it. So what we know so far is that uh, there's dose-dependent neurodegeneration um, at critical periods of postnatal development when anesthetics are administered. We know that there's a strong association between anesthesia exposure early in childhood and learning disabilities later in life, and there are a lot of rodent models. And this year is characterized by a lot of studies coming out uh, from uh, Ansgar Brambrink's group uh, using primate models. And they've studied uh, this phenomenon using ketamine, isoflurane, and propofol. And the bottom line with most studies is that all of these agents have been associated with an increase in neurodegeneration when administered during the second trimester. You can see here, this is a, a, a sample, it's a computer plot uh, depicting uh, apoptotic profiles in the uh, fetal brain. You can see that exposure to ketamine uh, during the second trimester causes uh, widespread neurodegeneration. In fact, the authors quantified this and compared it with neonatal neurodegeneration and provided evidence that the fetal brain was actually more vulnerable to anesthetic neurotoxicity than the neonatal brain. And they've repeated the same studies with propofol showing a similar trend and also with isoflurane showing a similar trend. And so what these studies um, add um, is that the brain is susceptible to the adverse effects of anesthetics, even uh, for the short duration of anesthesia. Um, and when I say short duration, it's all relative. So they used five hours of anesthesia in, in this primate model. And the effects occur with all classes of anesthetic agents. It's not just one. It, it includes the whole compendium. And the fetal brain remains uh, differentially susceptible. And uh, more surprisingly, it's not just the neurons, but also oligodendrocytes that were affected in the study. So I think um, I'm going to stop here uh, because I'm running out of time. And I'd like to conclude my lecture with this uh, quote by the most um, profound and influential thinkers of um, this century, Bertrand Russell. Science by itself cannot supply us with an ethic. It can show us how to achieve a given end, and it can show us that some ends can never be achieved. But among ends that can be achieved, our choice sometimes must be decided by other than purely scientific considerations. Thank you. Thank you.